December 1991, Nigel Mansell and his family moved across the Atlantic from the Isle of Man to a new winter home in Clearwater, Florida. The decision to relocate to a warmer climate was a part of Nigel's strategy for the 1992 season. I think it um, all came from the fact that I remained in Formula One racing and because of the injuries I've sustained over the years, which are well catalogued, but you know, a couple of broken backs and a broken neck and wrist and smashed toes, that the winters uh, in the Isle of Man or in England, uh, they're not only cold, wet and damp and you know, rather snowy at times, um, but for training and trying to keep fit and trying to be on best form for the coming season exactly isn't the right environment. So therefore, if you like to sort of prolong my career we made a very, very um, uh, difficult decision, and that is to, you know, winter in a foreign country, in Florida. And uh, I will say, in hindsight, that we're very comfortable with that decision. The interval between the last Grand Prix of 1991 and the first of the new year allowed time for reflection. Well, I mean, obviously, you can sort of have a good post-mortem about uh, last year. I think the things that I would like to sort of pinpoint is is the races that got away from us three races in particular the Canadian Grand Prix on the last lap where we were only about 14 seconds away from the finish line when the computer shut down then the race in Belgium at Spa when I was in the lead again and we had an electrical failure and of course uh, the other race which I was again in the lead um, we came in for a regulation pit stop in Portugal and they sent me out with uh, sort of four wheels on but only three nuts and obviously everyone knew what happened then, we were out of the race. So, I mean, just looking at those three races, and we only lost the championship by, I think it was 24 points. And uh, those three races are 30 points just there, so. And there's lots of other things. You can probably sort of write a list of about 17 different reasons why the championship didn't become ours last year. But uh, the thing is, we'll, we'll learn from it, and we'll go into this year now a lot stronger. Strength and stamina come from the meticulous preparation of both car and driver. Before those key elements were brought together in a pre-season test at Estoril, Nigel toned and exercised in Florida. While in England, the Williams team refined and developed the FW14.
Nigel repeatedly smashed the lap record. The Williams active ride suspension was a major breakthrough. At the Williams headquarters in Didcot, a winter of effort began to focus on the start of a new season. The World Championship was the target, not only for Nigel, but for his team too. Team owner, Frank Williams. Commercial director, Sheridan Thin. Technical director, Patrick Head. Chief designer, Adrian Newey. Team manager, Peter Windsor. And Nigel's race engineer, David Brown. At the traditional pre-season press conference, Nigel exuded confidence in both the team and his prospects. I think the understanding that Williams' team has and I have now, Frank Williams and Patrick Head, is uh, the best it's ever been in my career. I think the respect and mutual admiration we have for each other's ability as a team and as a driver is uh, at the highest point. And I feel that um, they are winners, they are racers, they're not there to make the numbers up. I'm not there to make the numbers up. We're there to get the job done this year, and that's to win the World Championship. And I think we have a, a real um, parallel objective this year, and I'm very, very comfortable with it. Well, this is, this is the, uh, the Williams Museum. I wouldn't like to put a price on these cars that are around here, but there's 50-odd uh, well, victories between... Uh, all these cars here and several world championships and constructors world championships so there's a tremendous amount of history just in this one room and I think it's all credit to uh, to Williams themselves and and the very sponsors they've had over the years we'll see you now in the uh, in the press conference the media gathered to report Nigel's assessment of his chances for 1992 it's a championship uh, with a reliability with it now 16 races and everyone counts so you've got the finish, you've got to score points regularly. So, uh, you know, we've had to address this and look at it very seriously, but getting back to your question, absolutely, I want the championship. I'd like it, I'm gonna try. I don't know whether I'm gonna get it, but I'll try. The main opposition came, as ever, from McLaren and its drivers. 1991 world champion Ayrton Senna and Austria's Gerhard Berger. Jean Alesi led the Ferrari challenge while Michael Schumacher was a highly rated outsider for the title. The Williams trump card for 1992 was its active ride suspension. It was an advantage that would be shared by Nigel's teammate Riccardo Patrese. The objective of an active ride car, you throw away springs, dampers, shock absorbers, all that kind of thing. You don't have any roll bars on the car. And everything is electronically controlled. And basically aerodynamics in a race car that when you go over 100 miles an hour play a very, very important part. In fact, over 50 miles an hour, uh, the aerodynamics is, is phenomenal. And therefore, if you can control the ride height of the car, because with normal springs and suspension, the faster you go, the more download you get on the car, and the closer the car gets to the ground. Well, of course, with an active ride car, it's being at any speed, the active ride is controlling the ride height of the car. And that is the air going underneath the car, as well as the air going across the top of it. So therefore, you can maximize your aerodynamics effect at slow speed, medium speed, and high speed. And you can, theoretically, practically, it's a lot harder, but theoretically, you can control the car's aerodynamics. And, um, or try, I'd say, not control, but you try to optimize them. So therefore, in any speed, in any corner, you try and get the best balance from the car. Um, and therefore, it is a step into the future. It's a phenomenal step forward, but ultimately, this year is going to be, the biggest single test is going to be for the active suspension. The first test came at the South African Grand Prix at Kyalami in March. The race was returning to the championship for the first time since 1985, and the drivers were faced with a new circuit layout. 
as the final preparations were made at the track, Nigel was also hard at work, determined to be at peak fitness for the new season. The gruelling winter fitness programme paid off. Although among the tallest of the Grand Prix drivers, Nigel weighed in four kilograms lighter than in 1991 and two kilograms less than his teammates. When the action moved to the track, Mansell emerged as the pace setter. Nigel was unbeatable in practice and qualifying. Whenever the cars took to the track, he was fastest. The headlines said it all. Well, I mean, uh, the headlines obviously are very flattering, but uh, the hard day's work uh, has just been completed. I'm very pleased to say that we, we managed to go a little bit quicker than yesterday and maintain pole position, which uh, obviously is uh, the best place to be on a track like this. So we start the race uh, tomorrow from pole position and we just hope that reliability now will uh, give me a fair, uh, fair shake and uh, you know, we can uh, complete the race. electrical fault in the final qualifying session forced Nigel to use his spare car in the race. And it's go and Mansell's got away extremely well as they go up to the first right-hander and sure enough it's that McLaren has dropped right back and up to the first left-hander that is turn four it's Mansell in the lead. Nigel raced away to a crushing victory leaving his rivals trailing far behind. Having dominated practice, having dominated the race, having put up the fastest lap in South Africa, he won in 1985. This is going to be a glorious back-to-back -back double, albeit separated by seven years. Well, he's done everything right today. No mistakes from Nigel Mansell. A marvellous drive. It's been easy, but he's handled it perfectly professionally. Tremendous win and a great start to 1992. And Mansell crosses the line to take the chicken flag. Nigel's win and Patrese's second place gave Williams a maximum score in the Constructors' Championship. Senna finished third, but was already wondering what it would take to get on terms with the Williams drivers. Well, I think I can recall, I said to everybody, that was plan A, to come out the starting blocks and win the first race, and for that to come into fruition was, uh, was fantastic. It was a great vote of confidence. Uh, not to put a foot wrong, to sort of be quick in all, um, how many sessions, nine sessions throughout the whole weekend was absolutely fantastic. Um, and of course to get those ten points on the board at the beginning, and I think what's so important in any championship is to score the points at the beginning of the year. Two weeks later, the Formula One teams were on another continent, in Mexico City, which was suffering record levels of pollution. Well, the problem with this particular circuit is the fact that um, uh, it's built on a, a lake bed, as we're aware. The circuit actually changes from year to year from the point of view that, you know, one part of the circuit last year might have been smooth, and this year is, in fact, there's, there's a, almost a small hill there. And uh, so, indicatively, it's bumpy, it's fast. And then you've got the other problems that, obviously, uh, and I'm, I'm not proud to tell you this, but it's a, a first, apparently, there's the most pollution in Mexico City in the history of Mexico today at 12 o'clock. And how this affects is that the dust and the pollution comes down on the circuit like dust, and it changes the circuit from lap to lap sometimes. And um, it just makes it very, very tricky. Just how tricky was graphically demonstrated in the first qualifying session by Ayrton Senna. Despite the treacherous track conditions, Nigel set another scorching pole time. On race day, a confident Mansell set off early to avoid the inevitable traffic jams and crowds. And 
on your right you see Nigel Mansell. He was on the left last year. He and Patrese had a terrific drag up to the first corner. Mansell's got away beautifully. Patrese is in second place. And, and there's a coming together right in the middle of the grid. That's Capelli going off in the Ferrari from 20th place on the grid. And the other one, I think, was Carl Wendlinger, the Austrian in the march. But it is Mansell leading. Patrese second. Senna is up into third place from sixth on the grid. While chaos reigned behind, the Williams Renaults pulled away to score a second successive 1-2 result. Senna's retirement early in the race was icing on the cake for Nigel. And he's now approaching the barrel powder down the last straight, the speed building. This is the barrel powder. Look for the chicken flag. Mansell is certainly doing so. There it is. Nigel Mansell wins in Mexico. After two races, both Mansell and Williams had perfect championship scores. McLaren was pulling out all the stops to get its new car ready for the next race. It's, uh, it's wonderful. It's a bit too early for it to all sink in at the moment, but very, very hard race. My teammate Ricardo Patrese drove uh, an excellent race and was <coughs> pushing real hard for about 30 laps. But, uh, I mean, we got the result that we wanted, so uh, I'm very, very comfortable with that. Two weeks later, the Formula One tour of Latin America came to Brazil. Sao Paulo is Ayrton Senna's hometown, but even with the support of the fanatical Brazilian crowd, their hero was over three seconds slower than Mansell in qualifying on Friday. It's been an absolutely scintillating and fantastic day. It really has. The Renault engines work tremendously well. Uh, the Williams car. I mean, the whole package, uh, the L fuel, we had some new fuel today, which obviously uh, contributed to the lap time too. And we put uh, a real good lap. I'd say one of my career best laps for qualifying today. I ended up 1.8 seconds quicker than my teammate. And he was in turn a second quicker uh, than the rest of the uh, competitors so I mean absolutely fantastic day for the team. In the final session on Saturday a misunderstanding between Mansell and Senna put Nigel off the track and into a concrete wall. He signalled for me to overtake. Oh. He signalled for, for me to come over on the left side and I was almost up to speed but not quite so by the time I got alongside him he put his foot down. Now, what made him put his foot down is, uh, and he can tell us, yeah. but then we ran out of road and obviously I ended up in the war and I was very you, you bruised were, and battered. You were well battered and you, and you had to have a medical on Sunday? I, uh, people don't realise, but I had, uh, I had concussion. Um, I was quite poorly in the medical unit for about two hours. And, uh, and then I got maybe two, two and a half hours sleep before then I went to the circuit to race. It's go. Now, who's going to get away first from the Williams? It's a magnificent start by Ricardo Patrese, who leads Nigel Mansell away. Patrese's been practicing his starts and it seems to be working. Patrese was the first driver other than Mansell to lead a Grand Prix in 1992. Senna's race with the new McLaren lasted just 17 laps. Nigel went to the pits for fresh rubber on the 27th lap. and took the lead when his teammate stopped for tyres two laps later. As the Williams team look for their team leader, and that he is, Nigel Mansell crosses the line. The Williams Renaults seemed unstoppable. Nigel had scored his third consecutive win of 1992 on his rival Senna's home ground. Fantastic, isn't it? I mean, I can't really believe it. It's just... Uh... The team's been done a marvellous job. I mean, the engine works superbly today, and I mean, my teammate, poor dear, he drove like a, a man possessed for the first half of the race. It was really tough to uh, try and get past, but the pit stop was very, very good, and uh, then I came out and did a couple of qualifying laps to get uh, the jump on him and the pit stop, and then I managed to pull away steadily then after that, which was nice. With three races run, Nigel led the World Championship with a maximum score of 30 points. Patrese was second with 18 points, ahead of Schumacher.
The four-week gap between the Brazilian race and the Spanish Grand Prix saw the Williams team maintaining the pressure on its rivals and hard at work testing the new Renault RS4 engine at Silverstone. Well, we've had a great day, we've done a lot of uh, comparison work, although it's been very uh, blustery, we've had up to sort of winds of 50 or 60 miles an hour. But the uh, cars ran reliable and uh, we're very pleased with it. The times are quicker than last year already, quicker than qualifying. So we've gone about a second quicker than, uh, than anyone's ever gone here before. And being as I was the person who went the quickest time before, that's nice. Um, quite a good day. The European leg of the Grand Prix series began in Barcelona with the Spanish Grand Prix. Nigel took his fourth pole position in the dry qualifying session on Friday. But in the rain on the morning of the race, the Williams team leader was fully aware of the task that lay ahead. It's going to be a little bit of a lottery and uh, the elements are going to play a very large part in uh, the outcome of the race today. Even if you get a good start, which obviously I'm hoping to get a good start, within 10 or 15 laps you'll be coming round to lap the back markers and in these conditions, not one driver will be able to see behind him because of the spray, the plumes of spray. And therefore, overtaking uh, even slow cars is going to be uh, very, very difficult. While wheels spun in the car parks, Jean Lacy found grip at the start and made a phenomenal getaway. As Mansell pulled away into the lead, First Patrese, and then Senna retired. The challenge was taken up by Schumacher, who managed to reduce Nigel's lead from 21 seconds to just five late in the race. But by the finish, Mansell had moved clear again to score his fourth win in four races. The Benetton driver was an excellent second ahead of Alesi's Ferrari. On the podium after the race, Nigel's relief was obvious. I mean, it was an incredible race because, um, I mean, just to stay on the circuit, you deserved a medal. And I had a f quite a few frights during the race. Um, one of them was when I was being caught two or three seconds a lap by the young Michael Schumacher. Yeah, right. And I was driving on the line and going as fast as I could, and I was committing myself. And, and you know, he brought my lead down from 21 seconds to about four seconds. And I was having, as much as you can, I was having a minor panic in the car saying, yeah. what on earth's wrong with you? I mean, I was looking at my lap times and they were the same, but I just wasn't going quick enough. And then all of a sudden, I started to get out of shape on some of the corners. And I actually found a lot more grip on the outside of the circuit. And then all of a sudden, from sort of doing the lap time I was, I was then able to go two or three seconds a lap quicker myself. And then, of course, I, st I stopped the flow. I stopped him catching me. And then ultimately, then I actually started to pull away again. And I'll tell you the absolute relief I had in the car when I was able to do that uh, was extraordinary. And I almost froze in the car. Yeah because I was responding and I wasn't doing anything. How, how, how on earth do you cope with aquaplaning, where you're literally well, riding on well a film of water? Well, that's the problem. Because I'd won the, the first uh, few races, I was protecting my lead yeah. safely. Yeah. And I couldn't protect it safely and still win, because he was driving so well and so quickly. Then I had to go totally to the edge of the envelope and beyond in those conditions to then go quicker. The Spanish Grand Prix victory was the 25th of Nigel's career, equaling Jim Clark's record in the all-time standings. Nobody had ever won the first five races of a season before. So, at the San Marino Grand Prix in May, Nigel Mansell had a chance to make Formula One history. In the Friday qualifying session, Nigel took pole position for the fifth race in a row with a time over a second faster than his teammate. The ever-enthusiastic Tifosi filled every imaginable vantage point and saw another dominant performance by Il Leone. Watch for the lights, then less than seven seconds between four and seven. Go! Mansell gets a bit of wheel spin. They've all 
got away well at the front. One of the Larousses is to the side. Mansell leads. Patrese is second. Senna coming up alongside the Italian. When Nigel stopped for fresh tyres on lap 23, there was an air of faultless efficiency, and he was able to rejoin the race still comfortably ahead of everyone else. Despite suffering from cramp in the closing laps of the race, Nigel drove magnificently onto a record fifth victory. And Mansell crosses the line for Williams Renault to win the San Marino Grand Prix very convincingly indeed having led from start to finish Riccardo Patrese there finishes in second position it was a performance that would rate among the best of his career and the drivers championship began to look a distinct possibility obviously been a fabulous day um, one of the greatest in my life there's no question to think that you've created history today in the whole sport for winning obviously five in a row from the beginning of the season it puts you amongst the greats of all time but it's a tribute and I must say it's a tribute to the team uh, to all the Renault engineers and designers to the Williams team especially uh, all the mechanics everybody back at the factory the associated sponsors to ELF the fuel supplier I mean uh, Without them, we'd do nothing, and so this race, this little bit of history we made today, is a big tribute to all of that. When you get on a roll like this, every race gets harder. It doesn't get easier, it gets harder from the point of view that, you know, I was looking at things going wrong. I was, um, as, you, as my mechanics will tell you, I mean, and they did a fantastic job. I mean, I, I thank them now, I mean. Gary Carl and, and Stuart and of course you know David Brown and, and, and the, uh, the guys on the, uh, on the T car as well, Bob and the crew, I mean thank you very very much. But you know they were so meticulous, I mean they were on a roll too, I mean they would get upset with the slightest thing wrong and you know I mean the trust that we had in one another to deliver and to do the job was, was, well, it was beautiful, it was beautiful. And now, join Nigel on a personal guided tour of the FW14. Well, here we have FW14B. Um, at the moment, uh, all the body works off, so you can see the various computers and control boxes. I won't identify exactly what does what, because uh, then I'll compromise my position within the team and the contract. This is top secret underneath here, so you can have a quick look quickly. I then put it down quickly and I never showed you it. Look, get the chief mechanic, he's looking at me now. <laughs> now this is Dickie, chief mechanic. Tell him, tell him Dickie, how uh, strictly confidential that is. Very confidential. Yeah. The essential parts of a Formula 1 Grand Prix car is, is obviously the suspension. The most incredible thing about this car, it doesn't have any. Yeah, this is basically, what do you call this now? Strut. Just a strut. Yeah. Strut. yeah? That does everything. And it has only a little bit more movement than that. And it just controls the ride height. Now, um, another little bit of... Uh, you got that? <coughs> um, this is the RS4 engine, which is a very good engine. Very tidy. Car is engineered very, very well indeed. I mean, if you look at a car and it looks tidy and clean, and the chances are it's, uh, the engineering of it is very good. Anyway, what we have here is a very good close-up of the steering wheel that we use to activate the gearbox. As you can see, all we do is just press the lever up and down like this, and that changes gear. Nice simple device, nice lightweight yoke. First, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and five, four, three, two, one. That's fairly straightforward, except when you're going around corners, you have to remember which way is up and which way is down, otherwise you can have a, uh, an exciting time. Uh, this button here is the automatic, uh, the automatic transmission, 
you press that button, you don't have to touch the steering wheel again, it changes up, up the gears all on its own and a preconceived uh, rev change. This button here, this can alter your ride height while you're going along and it's like a, a low drag uh, situation which everyone seems to know about now so I've got no problem telling you. Uh, these are all different settings on here that you can have on the dashboard which um, shows you the ride height, uh, standard ride height and the test ride height. I'd have to go along and say the aerodynamics comes first, uh, in my opinion this year I think the aerodynamics are second to none in the pit lane. The engineer in the car uh, comes uh, next, um, I think between Patrick Head and Asian Nui they've done a superb job, there's no question about that. And then the mechanical, that's probably, uh, although it's very very important, that comes next with this particular car. At Monaco, Nigel was a man with a mission to score his first ever win at one of his favourite circuits. Well here we are in Monte Carlo, the uh, sixth round of the Grand Prix season. I think you can see with uh, the scenery it's a little bit better uh, venue. I'm here with my family, my wife Roseanne and my three children, uh, Chloe who's uh, age nine, who's ten in August, Leo who's seven and uh, will be eight. Where are you Leo? Oh, he's, he's gone a running now. Oh there he is, he's hiding. <laughs> And uh, of course, Greg uh, the Terror, which uh, is hiding on the on the ground there, and he's uh, just four. Monaco offered a rare opportunity for Nigel and his family to be together at a Grand Prix. The Monaco schedule included a rest day. But relaxation Mansell style was not for the faint-hearted. One thing I can promise you, if you hook the ball to the left, you don't go and look for it. It's a long way down there. Follow us around and enjoy it. I remember, yes, I do. In qualifying on Saturday, Nigel secured pole position for the sixth race in a row. Patrese was second fastest, ahead of Senna. Can't see the exit, anyway, it's almost go. It is, Mansell gets away, Patrese gets in front of Senna, stays in front of Senna. Senna sprinting through and going up into second position ahead of Ricardo Patrese. As they go up the hill, are they getting round Sander Vox? Yes, they are. Mansell leads. Center is second. Patrese is third. Alesi is fourth. All seemed to go to plan for Nigel until a loosened rear wheel brought him into the pits just seven laps from the finish. What followed was pure drama. I say that it's probably the greatest second place I've had in my career um, and probably the most important second place I've had in the career because we could have so easily been put out of the race with the problem we had. So to get the car back to the pits and get the wheel changed and go out again and and we were what this close from really winning the race. 
It's a bit of pill to swallow when you're 30 seconds in front with only 10 or 12 laps to go, but nevertheless, uh, you know, it's motor racing. Many things can go wrong, and as been shown today, it does go wrong occasionally, but I think we bounce back um, very well. Um, I feel the championship, uh, you know, is all about gathering points. I have scored in all six races to date, and I think from the championship point of view, that is very significant and very important. Um, we could have so easily had an accident in the tunnel when the wheel came loose. And um, so, uh, you know, I've got half a smile on my face. He's waving to the crowd, and he's going to beat Nelson Piquet by some 50 seconds. He's, he's taking the hairpin very... He's stopping! Nigel Mansell, just a few hundred yards from the flag on the last lap. He's stopping, he's banging his steering wheel in frustration. Something has happened, it looks as though he's out of the race. Following the disappointment in Canada in 1991, the Williams team redoubled its efforts for 1992. Nigel would start from third on the grid. Frank Williams and Patrick Head knew it would be a tough race. And it's going, Senna really feeds into power, as does Mansell. They both leap forward, and Mansell is past Patrese already. Nigel Mansell up into second position, a sensational start. You get a wonderful impression of speed on this uh, Gilles Villeneuve circuit, named after the great Ferrari pilot Gilles Villeneuve. And there on the left you see Gerhard Berger, and there's a spin, and that is Matt Mansell. Mansell spun. Well, this is terrible for the British driver. He's going right. He looks as though he's out of the race. I see debris, and uh, hopefully we'll get a replay of this because we didn't see what happened there. Unfortunately, the replay offers no insight on the incident. A bad day for Williams was completed when Patrese retired with gearbox problems. A small consolation for Nigel came from the fact that Senna retired with an electrical failure. Berger won the race for McLaren, with Schumacher scoring another fine second place for Benetton. The big, biggest disappointment for me in Canada was not having the accident. The biggest disappointment was that the camera didn't show why. I mean, Ayrton, no, basically. We, we didn't say it at all. He just took me straight out. Oh. And, um, you know, I was wrong for one thing. I was wrong for coming up alongside of him and thinking that he would respect that I had the inside line. But. Those are the things that, unfortunately, that Ayrton does from time to time. And, uh, you know, he just pushed me straight off. In France, contract negotiations were to the fore. Rumours were circulating that Alain Prost had already signed a contract to partner Mansell in the Williams team in 1993. On the roads around the Mangy Coeur circuit, there was gridlock as a result of a national truck driver's strike. On the track, Mansell reasserted the supremacy of himself and the Williams Renault with another pole position. As the Williams drivers set off for the track on race day, rain clouds were gathering overhead. Michael Schumacher and Patrese noses ahead of Nigel Mansell. Now Patrese, who took pole position last year, has got a real flyer. And Schumacher challenging Ayrton Senna in the McLaren as they come up to the Adelaide hairpin. And there's a contact there. Who is it? It's Schumacher. And who is he hit? It's one of them. It's Senna. And now they're filtering their way round. Are they going to stop the race on the first lap? At the hairpin bend, Schumacher and Senna seemingly out. Mansell is really going for it. He's pressuring Ricardo Patrese all the time. He's going for it again at the Adelaide turn at the hairpin, trying on the outside this time. But Patrese doesn't give way there alongside. Surely Mansell will take the lead here. They're coming up to the Nürburgring here, the right and the left. And Mansell is in the passing position, but Patrese forces him back. Well, this is a terrific scrap between two equally determined teammates in two perfectly matched Williams Renaults. And the red flag is out. The race is being stopped. The red flags are out. The track had dried by the time the race was restarted. 
Patrese took the lead again and unfortunately Schumacher was involved in another accident. Mansell moved ahead at the end of the first lap of race two and despite the return of the rain, the williams Renaults finished first and second for the fifth time in eight races. And Nigel Mansell can almost see the chequered flag as he goes into the right-hander. This is the last corner. That is the finish line. There is the chequered flag. Nigel Mansell wins in France for the second year in succession. Nigel's victory was the 27th of his career, equaling the British record for Grand Prix wins held by Jackie Stewart. The Drivers' Championship was turning into a rout for Mansell, while in the Constructors' Contest, Williams had scored almost as many points as all the other teams put together. I can drive, I have the ability at the moment anyway to drive quicker than certainly Ricardo in the same car and he has to run something like 5 to 10 litres per race more fuel in the car than I do because the way he uses the throttle, the way he goes in and out the corners and, and that and he uses more engine revs than that. So he had, he had a problem in France that you know if he tried to keep going the pace he was going he wouldn't have finished the race period. A week after the French Grand Prix, Nigel made his way to Silverstone for the annual appearance in front of his home crowd. Hi. Thank you. Once we start there, we're in trouble, aren't we? Where do you want it? Where do you want it? Anywhere. Anywhere. There you go. Oh, well, let me tell you how to tell. There you go. Oh. Well right. done. Love to see you. Thank I've been you. dying for these for ages. I was just going back for the rest. Yeah, how are you? All right. Oh, I'm fine now. <laughs> oh, it's grand. There you go. <laughs> oh, thank you, you ever so much. As Nigel settled into his caravan encampment, Jackie Stewart paid tribute to the man who had equaled his record. Well, I sent Nigel a telegram or a fax actually saying welcome very temporarily to the 27 Club because I'm sure he's going to be a very short time member. But of course I'm very pleased for him. It's very nice that this amount of success has come in the manner that it has. And of course he's a worthy, worthy person to have knocked up 27 victories. I can't complain, I'm very pleased for him because I've held this record now for 19 years. So uh, I'm just pleased that there's another British driver up there winning as often as Nigel is. Meanwhile, another triple world champion was facing up to some hard facts. To be realistic about it, I think we have uh, very little chances uh, in this year championship. Um, of course, as long as mathematically it's not over, you have just to keep on trying. But um, definitely the williams Renault combination is the favourite one, is the dominant one. And um, I think we will unfortunately continue that way until the end of the year at least. The Williams dominance was there for all to see in qualifying. Nigel taking pole position with a lap almost two seconds faster than Patrese and nearly three seconds clear of Senna. Only Nigel's son Greg looked like catching him all weekend. Even directors of Williams Grand Prix Engineering weren't immune from the sharpshooting Mansell boys. <laughs> Later, Mansell Rovers took on all comers in the Silverstone Cup. One of those five midfield players has almost certainly been given the specific task of marking Nigel. Oh, it's in! What a splendid shot! Good challenge. Now the game is really opening up. Oh, that wasn't a bad effort at 
Mitchell. Tapped in there. Getting into the attack. Well, no shortage of incident. That too was a good chance. There are chances developing, and I'm sure we're going to see some more goals before the final whistle is blown. Until the final whistle. The carnival atmosphere of the Grand Prix weekend eventually gave way to the serious business of racing. Silverstone was packed to the rafters with an expectant crowd. The British Grand Prix of 1992 is go, and Mansell straight on the power. Patrese alongside him, the, the Italian has again outdragged Nigel Mansell. He leads into Cops, and Martin Brundle has passed Schumacher. And then the two McLarens, and Martin Brundle has made an absolute flyer, as has Patrese. And Patrese, the Italian in the Williams Renault, is now in second position because Nigel Mansell has exerted his authority and has surged past Patrese. Leading in front of his adoring fans, Nigel pulled out an unassailable advantage. Senna's season of woe continued with a broken gearbox on lap 52. Seven laps later, Mansell romped home to deliver another superb win for the Silverstone crowd. They're breaking ranks, the Union Jacks are waving, and Nigel Mansell wins the 1992 British Grand Prix in terrific style. Hands off the wheel. Nigel's win was his fourth British Grand Prix victory. As the fans celebrated another win, however, there was cause for concern as Mansell mania had reached new proportions. A reckless and misguided track invasion as the race finished could easily have ended in tragedy. But not even a foolish minority could detract from Nigel's achievement. 28 Grand Prix wins was a new record for a British driver. I give the crowd something that I believe other drivers don't. I relate to them. Whatever shortcomings I have, and there might be quite a few, they know that if I say something, they know that that's correct, right? Because I don't play petty politics or huge politics. I don't know how, and I don't want to. And on the track, they can see I'm trying. They can visibly see that I'm going for a lap. They don't need to guess. They can see it. And I mean, even to the point that, you know, the qualifying lap and then two laps before the end of the race, right, I lowered the track record by another two seconds a lap. I didn't do that for me, I did it for them. When they can stand up on every lap and wave and cheer and all the rest of it, you right? Can't, you can't, you can't see oh, them, you can, you can see them, it, surely. you can see it, and on some corners you can hear it. Well, when you're going down the hangar straight, you better really, believe it. Really. Yeah, they are something else. At the high-speed Hockenheim circuit, the grid for Sunday's race had a familiar look, with Mansell on pole and Patrese alongside. And it's go. Good start by Mansell. Patrese's done it again. Ricardo Patrese has got another flyer and leads into the first corner. And coming down towards us now, it's Mansell attacking. Ricardo Patrese is going to take the lead on the first lap or try to. And Senna comes up alongside Berger, followed by the two Benettons. And it's Mansell leading. Patrese second, Berger third. Senna is in fourth place. A puncture warning light brought Nigel in for an early pit stop. He rejoined just behind Senna and was soon climbing all over the back of the McLaren. At the Oscar chicane, Nigel had a scary moment and almost left the circuit. But he recovered his composure and overcame Senna's stubborn defensive tactics. 
leaving his teammate to battle with the Brazilian for second place. And what a tremendous finish. Indeed it is. It's going to be the closest Grand Prix finish we've had for a long, long time. Because Patrese spins and loses that third position. But Nigel Mansell wins in Germany and he equals Ayrton Senna's record. Another magnificent drive had put the championship almost within Mansell's reach. After Hockenheim, Nigel needed one more win to settle it. He'd come tantalisingly close twice before, in Adelaide in 1986 and in Suzuka in 87. In August 1992, the World Drivers' Championship was within his reach again. Nigel flies to his date with destiny aboard a private jet. His companions, Williams commercial director Sheridan Thin, and his wife, Roseanne. I'm now going to Budapest with uh, bated breath because, yes, you're right, if we win here in Budapest this weekend, the elusive world championship could be ours. As Nigel drove to the circuit for Friday qualifying, the tension was evident. the prolonged contractual negotiations having added to the pressure that he was under. Here we are at the circuit, you're on the, uh, the main gate now and no doubt you'll be filming some of the circuit and get a couple of the corners where we'll be going round. As I said, probably going to be one of the toughest days in my life because of the concentration, the fact of the championship and a lot of things going on I can't talk to you about at this moment but uh, we'll certainly enlighten you as the weekend goes on. Catch you later. Bye-bye. In qualifying, things were not going smoothly. And Saturday was no better. Nigel couldn't improve on his Friday time and had to be content with second place behind his teammate. As the sun went down, Nigel was in pensive mood. Tomorrow will uh, be obviously one of the most important races of my whole life and certainly of my career. Um, we will be driving with as much calm and composure and as fighting spirit as the circuit will allow us because the circuit is not what I call a proper racing circuit. Um, we will all have to be patient and, and see what happens. I'm really looking forward and hope dearly that I can get a good night's sleep tonight. Although there's lots of other pressures with contracts and people pushing and pressurizing you and pulling you in different directions. Um, if it was easy, everybody would be doing it. It was to be an uneasy night for the world champion elect. As the sun rose on race day, attention was concentrated onto one man. The crowds arrived early, eager to see events unfold.
And that's it. Good start by Mansell on the inside. Patrese is going quicker, but Senna is up into third position ahead of Schumacher. Berger goes round Schumacher up into third position. And he's passed one of the Williams. I didn't see which it was. It's Patrese leading. It is Senna in second place. So already the McLarens are ahead of the man who hopes to win the World Championship here. Nigel Mansell in fourth position. And there goes... Schumacher, there it goes Mansell, Mansell through and up into third position, I'm sorry, Nigel Mansell chasing Ayrton Senna, Ricardo Patrese still leading by now nearly 17 seconds, the Gerhard Berger goes past, Mansell ran wide and Gerhard Berger, that's exactly what he was looking for, ah uh, yes, you see him now, Berger got the power on early, but Mansell was quicker than him earlier in the race. And Mansell goes through, Berger leans on him. And there is Mansell, a spin, for, that's Patrese. Yeah, Ricardo Patrese, the race leader off, and he's, he's out of the race. Unless he can get going under his own traction, and he's not going to, this is a, an astounding development, and it's going to mean that we've got the same situation here this year that we had last year. Senna leading, and Mansell in second position. With Patrese out of the race, Nigel's second place would be enough to clinch the championship. But suddenly, it all seemed to be falling apart as Red 5 headed into the pits for a fresh set of tyres. This is a sensational development that could affect Nigel Mansell's World Championship chances. It is lap 62 and the Englishman comes in. Now, why? Is it a retirement or is it tyres? Well, they're certainly changing tyres. Meantime, I'm looking for Berger going through, for Schumacher coming through, for Brundle coming through. It's only a short stop. Mansell accelerates out of the pits. Nigel rejoined in sixth place, which soon became fifth after Schumacher's dramatic exit from the race. Hakkinen was the next target. Then Brundle. And then Berger. For the third time, Nigel passed Gerhard to regain second place. Ayrton Senna was too far ahead to be caught, but Mansell was now within a lap of his lifetime's dream. But where is Nigel Mansell on the last lap for second place? Here he is, Mansell finishes, and he's world champion and a tremendous uh, effort for Nigel Mansell. He's uh, fought long and hard for this. He's the highest, third highest Grand Prix winner of all time and a well-deserved it is. And uh, I must confess to suffering some emotion myself. Nigel emerged physically drained to the applause of a jubilant crowd and the congratulations of his rivals. All the fans out there and all the supporters for the years and uh, especially my country and, and that this is all for you. And I think uh, Roseanne Mansell will be pretty relieved at this moment. Yeah, I just can't wait to see her. And uh, Chloe? Happy birthday. It's your birthday today and I hope this is the biggest present you'll ever get in your life. home to the Isle of Man. I don't know whether it has sunk in yet. I mean, I've got this silly smile on my face and I've just about gathered my breath and you know what I mean? Oh, it's just the most fantastic feeling and the best day in my life. roseanne has been the trump card in my whole life. 
If I'd not made, if I'd not met Roseanne and I'd not married Roseanne, I wouldn't be sitting here now. She's the most marvellous woman that any man could wish to have as a wife. And I'm pleased there's only one of her. Back home on the Isle of Man, there was a hero's welcome. <laughs> then it was home to celebrate with the family. To all of you out there who's watching this, a very, very big thank you because this is world, this world championship that we've managed to win after 30 years, if you like, because that's the first time I drove a car, eight, nine, uh, when I was eight or nine, um, is partly yours. I mean, you gave me the support, you gave me the encouragement, and you all made me unretire two years ago, and we did it all for the right reasons. Thank you very much. Two days later, Nigel and Roseanne faced the press. Good morning, we're going to play golf now. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they're hoping. The phone hasn't stopped ringing. The gates, the gate buzzers haven't stopped. And uh, really, the house has been absolute chaos. People have been coming and going, and I just don't know sort of where the last two days have gone. With Prost seemingly confirmed as a Williams driver for 1993, what did the future hold for Nigel? You know, even more today than two years ago, I'm not there to make the numbers up. And um, therefore, one might consider retiring, obviously. Nigel, are you then saying then it is Williams or retirement? <coughs> That's like <coughs> In Belgium, the pressure on Nigel had intensified following Senna's misleading offer to drive for Williams for nothing in 1993. Sheridan Thin was trying to resolve things favourably for Nigel. There are some problems, we're working on them and they will be um, dealt with with the minimum of delay because from the point of view of the team, the drivers, stability, engineering, sponsors from every point of view, it's desirable to sort this matter out as quickly as we can. What is exactly happening? I'm not quite sure, except there's some very, very uh, strange uh, things uh, being negotiated, and I think it comes down to commercial and um, sponsorship and basically manufacturers' pressures. I'm sure he's uh, frustrated because, like all serious racing drivers, he's, he's impatient and wants to get on with the job. Um, I hope we have... Uh, enough mutual respect that he doesn't uh, blame me personally for these delays and indeed I've been uh, trying to ease things in, in recent days and uh, he's aware of that. Patrese seemed to be out of the Williams equation and bound for Benetton. And now Ayrton Senna was out of the running too. Trust has a contract, he has a clause in there that has a veto for me to drive and uh, it's nothing you can do about it. A good result at Spa would secure the Constructors' Championship for Williams. I'd just like to introduce you to somebody who makes my racing as easy as it is. David Brown, race engineer, Team Williams. David and I have won together now um, 26 races. And I think that's an astonishing record on its own, isn't it, David? It's a lot. It's a lot of races. It's a lot. Yeah. David says to me many times, though, it's not enough. But uh, I'd just like David... Um, just in a few words to explain exactly his responsibilities within the team. Thank you, Nigel. Not a minute. It's my responsibility within the team. Reliability of the car, making it good enough and quick enough so Nigel can go around and drive every lap of the race flat out. I would say it's probably a good way of putting it, wouldn't you? David is very modest because without him, I couldn't actually function as a race car driver and I couldn't actually win the race. Why? David is the key individual that actually translates all my requirements onto the car via the mechanics. So, I mean, he is modest and he is uh, one of the great engineers of, uh, in my opinion, of all time in Formula One. 
And the most important thing I'd like to go on record and say to all of you, David is part of my World Championship this year. We've been a great team, and I say to him now on, 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 on the TV, thanks, David. Are they all going to get round? Petzl gets away beautifully. And there's somebody stuck. It looks like Gerhard Berger. It is Gerhard Berger. And Senna is in the lead ahead of the two Williams. Three out of 26 have retired, and we are now on the second lap out of 44. And Mansell going for it. Now he challenges. Is he through at the bus stop? Yes, yes. Mansell is absolutely together. They're coming down to the left hander now. Mansell leads. Senna second, but Tracy third. As the rain began to fall, Nigel was the first to stop for treaded time on lap three. By lap 11, the Williams Renault was in the lead again. As the circuit dried, Nigel needed another tyre change. When Nigel made his second pit stop on lap 33, Schumacher took the lead. A broken exhaust ended Nigel's attempts to catch the young German, and he was forced to settle for second place. The first win ever for, Nut, for Michael Schumacher, and he puts his arm out, and he is naturally elated. With its cars finishing second and third at Spa, Williams clinched the Constructors' Championship with four races still to run. There's no question that, uh, you know, things would have gone right and, and even if the car would have worked good until the end, I mean, you know, I still felt that we could win the race. I mean, I got within a couple of seconds of Michael, and, uh, but then, you know, we lost a cylinder on the engine with the injector. Um, but, I mean, Michael is uh, no question, considering it is his first year, as you point out, I think he's done exceptionally well. In the Williams camp at Monza, all seemed calm on the surface, and Nigel and Ricardo even played in a celebrity football match against a team of Formula One media people. Behind the scenes, the contractual wrangling was coming to a head, but having got pole position, Nigel concentrated on putting the odd goal away. Could have been a whole number of things happening today, but the goalpost move, as ever, very quickly in Formula One, and prudence is prevailing. And as much as I'm being patient, I'm listening. And uh, as soon as I leave you here now, I should be making a phone call to my wife to discuss certain things and revelations I found out about today. And it might well be that um, you know I might take charge of the situation tomorrow. Great legs, but they're ever so tired. As he set off for the circuit on race day, Nigel's good humour concealed the bombshell he was about to drop. Due to circumstances beyond my control, I have decided to retire from Formula One at the end of this season. It is go, and Alesi goes straight past Ayrton Senna as they accelerate to the Retifilio, and the Italian crowd roars with approval. Mansell leads in the Retifilio, Senna comes through to second place, locks up. Displaces Jean Alesi, and here is Patrese challenging Ayrton Senna for second place as they go through into the 14th lap, and he's going through. Is he? Yes. Senna tries to hold him off but fails. Nigel pulled out a huge lead in the opening laps, but on lap 20, it was Patrese who led his teammate across the start line. It was only when Nigel retired on the 41st lap that it became clear that he'd tried to help Patrese to win his home Grand Prix. But Nigel's generous gesture proved to be for nothing when Patrese ran into mechanical trouble too. Senna won for the third time in 1992, while Brundle had his best ever finish with second place. But the race result was overshadowed by Nigel's dramatic announcement. Well, it depends how you look at it, really. I mean, uh, obviously it's very sad because it's come to the point that uh, I've chosen to retire, but there's many reasons why um, I've taken that decision. Um, I wouldn't say that it was taken voluntarily. I mean, what I would like to do now, and for the viewers, is actually read the statement that was put out this morning. 
and that is um, due to circumstances beyond my control I have decided to retire from Formula One at the end of the season. I have made this decision with some regret but not without a great deal of thought. Any relationship between a driver and a Formula One team is vital for success and partly dependent on money because it defines how seriously the team and its backers take the driver. For those who know me well understand the importance of the human side and the mutual trust and goodwill and integrity and fair play that are the basis of all human relationships. All these issues have suffered in recent weeks. Looking back, I feel that relationships between me and the Cannon Williams team started to break down in the Hungarian Grand Prix. A deal was agreed with Frank Williams before that race in front of a witness. That was my wife in point of fact. And I have to say that at the time I felt very good about racing again with Williams in 93. Having won the championship, I was looking forward to defending the title with what I believe to be a very competitive car. To have the motivation to win a world championship, you must in turn have those commitments back from the team. When I returned from Ferrari, I did so with the belief that I had the motivation and the team had the commitment. I don't think I was wrong. Now things are different. I no longer feel, so far as I am concerned, that the commitment from the team towards me for next year is there. There are many reasons for this and I have tried to give some idea of how I feel. Other people will no doubt draw their own conclusions. For one thing it is clear that Alan Pross has, be has been committed to the team for months. For another, I thought I had a deal when clearly I did not. And needless to say, I do not understand why these things have happened. Yes, in recent weeks various people have tried to smooth things over and I respect that and I thank them for their time. But now I realise that it's all too late. To my mind it comes down to fair play or the lack of it. Money a trigger for the problems after Hungary is now no longer an issue for me. In finishing, I'd like to say in the most sincerest of ways that I will always be grateful to the Williams team and Renault for the support they have given me in 1992. Nigel, what was the contractual situation in Hungary? I agreed to deal with Frank to drive in 1993 before the race. In Hungary? In Hungary. Can, 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 can you just spell that out because it's terribly important. You, you and Frank had reached Rizan an agreement. Rizan and I, in a meeting with Frank, agreed financial terms to drive for Williams and the associated sponsors in the 1993 season, before the race and uh, subsequently then we had an incredible telephone call on Wednesday from a director of Williams, which was Sheridan, stating literally verbatim that the deal that uh, we had struck was not a deal anymore uh, and that the goalposts had moved because Ayrton had offered his services for nothing and they said that if I was not to agree in one hour th they had Ayrton there waiting in France that night to sign a two-year deal that evening. And I said, well, I'll give you the answer now. You don't have to call back in an hour. The answer is, regrettably, sign out, and, you know, because I'm not going to work under those conditions. And I just said how disgusted I was. And then, you know, I have to say that Sheridan, uh, out of his own volition, after putting the phone down on, on, my, on me, uh, wrote his own resignation there and then and delivered it that night to Frank Williams' house. I think that for, for any negotiation to be successful, there is a commercial side and a human side. I think the, the commercial side was nearly achieved, and uh, it required a human commitment to put things together at the end of the day. I was certainly very much involved in that. I certainly worked as hard as I could towards it. I know Nigel wanted it very much, and uh, um, I think it's easy for people watching this to know who else needed to make a great commitment and uh, not only within Williams but in some of our major partners and they didn't perhaps want it quite enough for it to happen. You made this dramatic appearance to read a withdrawal from Formula One statement and while you were making that statement one of the Williams people, Gary Crumpler, came in and said something to you. What was it all about? Oof. Well, it's a tough one but I'll tell you, as it is, they basically um, agreed to everything. 
they upped the money by X millions of dollars. And he said, look, everything's agreed. You've got the money, you've got this. Stop this, stop it now. And I was sitting in front of you all. Yes. I was embarrassed in front of all yeah. the cameras, all the press, that they could even consider doing something like that at the, at the literally the 11th hour. Um, I've been fortunate this year that I've been able to travel around with Nigel probably to more of the races than I ever have done since having the children. Consequently, I've been in on all the negotiations from the start, and I suppose I've probably had an even more difficult time of it than Nigel to comprehend yeah. as to how it could have ended up how it had ended up. When you think one minute something is there, the offer is there, everything is agreed and on the table, and the next minute the tablecloths whip from underneath you. On the Friday after the Italian Grand Prix, the Newman Haas IndyCar team announced that Nigel Mansell had signed a one-year, multi-million dollar contract to race for them in America in 1993. Thanks for coming. Yeah, well, that's a good one, isn't it? I mean, obviously, uh, we signed for the Newman Haas team, and uh, that's going to be an incredible new challenge. Can't really tell you much about the cars. I've never driven one, never sat in one. Whatever it's going to be, it's going to be very exciting for everybody. I don't see any reason why Nigel can't, can't do that. I think he's going to catch on quicker than everybody thinks. In Portugal, Mansell was back on top form with pole position from the first qualifying session. These next three races are almost, um, in some ways, quite romantic because, you know, I won't be coming back here again. Uh, whereas, up until a few weeks ago, I hadn't had that concept in my head. So therefore I'm going places now, seeing people I won't see for a long, long time, uh, if at all, ever again. And therefore there is a tinge of sadness, but a tinge also of great expectancy for a new life, a new future and a new challenge. And uh, that excites me a lot. And it's go. Mansell kicks it sideways. Gets away well. So they're trying to get up on the right. The burger is already up into third position ahead of his teammates. It's Mansell leading for Tracy second. Senna taking third place from Gerhard Berger and challenging for Tracy. Here he is. He is into the pits. It was that right rear last year that caused the problem. They'll be on tender hooks this time. Well, that was nothing to write home about. But 9.45 seconds has at least got Nigel Mansell back into the race on four wheels. Six laps from the finish, Patrese was involved in a potentially disastrous collision with Gerhard Berger's McLaren. Oh dear, oh dear. Oh, you... Well, let us hope and pray that Ricardo is all right as he clouted Gerhard Berger's car. You saw he is all right, I think. You can see his head moving, he's got the visor up. You can see his eyes. But my goodness, that, that, was, that could have been a terrible, terrible accident. It was bad enough, but thank heaven, Patrese seems to be all right. He took it pretty quietly early on, then he, in the middle of the race, he really put the hammer down and uh, charged away from everybody and uh, turned it into yet another very easy win indeed. And as Mansell crosses the line, Mansell wins the Portuguese Grand Prix. Continuing a year of record breaking, Nigel set two new standards in Portugal. The most points in the season and the most wins in the season. What happened with Estoril, the pit lane entrance, was it's not really well defined, there's no real yellow line. It caught Ricardo totally by surprise and he didn't have time to react and hence he ran up the back and then just took off. And we all know what subsequently happened next. And I think it was the most dreadful visual accident that we've seen in recent times. It's been so much worse, of course. And there's no question the cars are strong, but forget the cars being strong. He cheated death by that much. Round 15 of the 1992 World Championship gave Nigel an opportunity to score his first Japanese Grand Prix win in Honda's backyard. Go! Mansell moves across to the centre. On Ricardo Patrese who's trying to go up on the inside. 
and Gerhard Berger challenges Ayrton Senna as they go round the first right-hander at turn one. And it's the two Williams in front with Ayrton Senna in third position. In fourth position, it is his teammate Gerhard Berger. And you can see the lead already. As I speak, Senna slowing right down this early in the race and he's obviously going to retire. Dreadful for Honda and for McLaren. And Nigel Mansell will probably have that information relayed to him by the pits to car radio and will be feeling even happier as a result of it than he was before. Mansell has stopped. We've got news that I can't see him, but he's moving. Uh, you, you can't see Nigel Mansell. You are looking at Andrea De Cesaris, who is in seventh position. And Ricardo Patrese on lap 37 has gone into the lead. But I suspect, and it is only a guess, that the new leader, Ricardo Patrese, is having this race donated to him by Nigel Mansell. It's going to be very interesting to see. And there's a fire. Nigel Mansell's Williams is on fire. Well... This, this solves it. Nigel Mansell is not going to finish in the Japanese Grand Prix. He's on lap 45 and he's coming in to retire. Well, he had generously donated victory to Ricardo Patrese and he walks in to retire. Into the chicane for the last time. He really could coast home and win now. And a more popular victory it would be hard to imagine. Ricardo Patrese wins the 1992 Japanese Grand Prix. Gerhard Berger coming through into second position. And Martin Brundle is going to take third position. Well, the engine just let go, which was a bit of a shame. Um, but I mean, up until then, everything was going well. As you can see, with 20 odd laps to go, I pulled over and just let Ricardo by. Yeah, I was pleased. I wasn't pre-arranged as such, but I said I'd help him and I figure for him to go into the last race with six points ahead of Ayrton is better than only two. So, uh, you know, I'm just sad that we weren't, uh, you know, one, two and, you know, I should have got another six points, which is a shame. On November the 8th, 1992, Nigel Mansell drove in his last Formula One race at the Australian Grand Prix in Adelaide. Perfect! Mansell gets away beautifully! Patrese closes up on Senna. Everybody is getting away. Mansell leads. Senna second. Patrese third. Schumacher is up to fourth. Alessi is fifth. Berger is down to sixth. Brundle is seventh. There's a spinner. It's one of the Dallaras. And Griar is out already. And now is the time for the Williams to try to get away. But this is the time when McLaren will be strongest. And McKen the Senna goes through. Senna leads. Mansell retakes it. Wow. Already the Titans are fighting. Well, we always knew that this Australian Grand Prix was a potential ripper, and it's turning out to be just that. Mansell leads Senna. And there are the leaders, and Senna really tried, but there's still a car in front of them. They'll both go out! Senna, De Mansell was destined not to finish the Australian Grand Prix, and that's exactly the same situation for Ayrton Senna that he was in in the previous year with his left wheel, and Mansell is he's furious, furious! You have destroyed my opportunity of winning the 10th Grand Prix of the year. Now Senna was trying to take advantage of the back marker situation. He tries to get inside. Mansell, he loses the back of his car. And Mansell, Nigel Mansell, absolutely the innocent party in that. And a great shame for Nigel Mansell. So, Nigel Mansell's last Formula One race ended premature. And uh, it is starting to rain, possibly on the circuit we've got a serious threat of it anyway and Patrese stop Patrese and Berger takes the lead and what happened to Ricardo Patrese and Michael Schumacher fighting to the last inch of the Australian Grand Prix has given us a magnificent race then down to the last corner in Australia for the last Grand Prix of 1992 Berger backs off as he crosses the line and he wins the Australian Grand Prix by seven tenths of a second. You know, as I predicted, the McLaren and the Honda combined yeah. with Ayrton here and Gerhard, uh, this Gerhard went on to win, um, was very formidable. Um, and the disappointment was that, you know, we came up on traffic, which should have been sort of normal, and uh, we got through the first bit of traffic, but then Ayrton, uh, let's give him the benefit of the doubt, but 
it's obviously he made a very sort of serious mistake and uh, you know just took me straight out I mean I wasn't even expecting it and I had a big thump up the back and that was it race was over the final drivers championship table was headed by Nigel Mansell with a record score of 108 points Ricardo Patrese finished second with Schumacher third so at the end of the 1992 Grand Prix season Nigel Mansell said a sad farewell to Formula One Nigel made his Grand Prix debut in Austria in 1980 and took part in 181 races. His total of 30 victories made him the third most successful driver of all time. Nigel's hard charging driving and never say die spirit will be sadly missed. I think Nigel Mans was one of the most aggressive drivers that we've seen for quite some time highly spirited very heavily motivated and when he's on I think there are few people can keep up with Nigel Mansell there has been rather a, a dearth of success in the country yes. in recent yeah. times you know it's good yeah. to see yeah. something you yeah. can latch on to yeah. and uh, I hope you know the economy and everything else latches on to Nigel I think Nigel is a great racer I think he's given the sport an enormous amount of pleasure because if Nigel's not there it isn't really boiling, you know. The greatest thing of all is that I'm leaving Formula One with the most wonderful and best prize in the world, which is the championship. And I think, as you all agree, with the amount of work and years I've put into my Formula One career, I think it's fair to say that we deserve that. And uh, if you have to leave Formula One, isn't that the best way to leave it? With the greatest prize of all. Nigel Mansell's 1992 Grand Prix year was one of the greatest of all time. He broke record after record in a season of unparalleled success, finally to achieve his life's ambition with an assured dominance in a superb car. It's sad indeed that having become world champion after 30 years of driving effort, he's seemingly destined not to defend his title in 1993. But he leaves Formula One with his head held high and his countless thousands of fans worldwide with a multitude of stirring memories of his grit, skill and determination. They would all want to say thank you Nigel and every success for the future.